So last month, we have the, the first part of the CFIUS and, uh, uh, talk. And in the second part of that, uh, we're honored to have Mr. Carl Valenston with us today. Um, Carl is a member of the Morgan Lewis community on CFIUS Working Group. He's a frequent speaker at a conference on a variety of international compliance and transactional topics. In today's talk, Carl will discuss CFIUS due diligence from the company and the investor perspective, increase the risk of CFIUS review of non-notified transactions, the difference between mandatory and the voluntary CFIUS filing and more. So please stick around for our Q&A section at the end. Welcome, Carl. Thanks very much, Ella. Um, this is a complex topic, um, and there's a lot more detail in the slides, which I'm happy to make available to people um, after this, this talk. Uh, so I'll talk for maybe 40, 45 minutes, and then uh, open it up to Q&A. Um, and we'll, you know, I, I will, I'm going to cover this at a very high level. So just, I think, a little bit of background in history. Uh, I was a history major in, in before going to law school, so I think it's always good to start with a little history. The U.S. has had an open investment policy for a long time, um, but we've also had uh, uh, policies and procedures and statutes regulating, for national security reasons, foreign investment in the United States. But there's been a lot of talk about CFIUS in China, and, and I think a perception created that there's almost a wall that's special to China on that. And that's not really true. While it's true statistically that the, a, a number of, of, of high profile Chinese transactions have been uh, interrupted or blocked by CFIUS, it actually represents a very small percentage of transactions. So I, I want to kind of deescalate the concern over this, but because of recent changes that I'm gonna talk about, it's become something that is no longer a voluntary system in some cases but has become a mandatory system. So what's very important is that prior to FIRMA, which is this new legislation that was adopted in 2018, CFIUS was entirely voluntary. You know, unlike antitrust clearances, where if you meet the threshold, you have to file, CFIUS was done based on voluntary uh, decision by the parties. And the reason parties did it was that it gave for, uh, foreign investors the comfort that the, the US government wasn't gonna come back later and uh, challenge that. And they, and they did that in a few, but very few uh, transactions, largely involving you know, Chinese state-owned enterprises or military connected. What, what was what's fundamentally different about FIRMA in 2018 was in two respects. One is it introduced the concept of mandatory filings because the, the, the Congress felt that there were things slipping through the cracks that the government wasn't able to detect. And it also, for the first time, and this really had an impact on life sciences, which in the US gets so much foreign venture capital money, it introduced a, a concept of investments that are not change of control transactions, suddenly triggering mandatory filings in certain situations. There was a lot of concern that this was gonna be um, uh, far more disruptive uh, th than it than it actually was, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. It, it you know it, it, because people realized that um, those situations were more limited than they thought, but there was a almost a panic by the 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 early startup community and venture capital community that all all of a sudden deals were going to get interrupted, and and now we've had a couple years of experience. And we learned how to work through those issues. And I'm going to share that experience with you in, in a very high level in the next in the next 40 minutes. So just, just, you know, just a little bit of history. US is not alone in this. You know, China has all national security reviews that it's enhancing. Europe and other countries are doing this. This is becoming a worldwide uh, phenomenon. And, and so um, a lot of people are realizing that there are national security implications to trend. But the U.S. is one of the first. And of course, the U.S. tends to be more vigorous in the way it enforces everything. And, and so there's been a lot of discussion about this. So I've, I've kind of talked about the history of, you know, what was blocked. It was largely state-owned enterprises with military connections. The thing that caught the public's eye, particularly in life sciences space, was because transactions didn't have to be notified. Um, but 
the government always reserved the right if it was covered under the under the regulations to come in later. There were a number of, of high profile transactions, and I mentioned them here, that caught everybody's attention. So for example, the Beijing Kunlun grinder uh, case where there was no requirement to notify, the government came in, felt that there was personal sensitive personal data being used by US military on this, and they forced the divestiture. There's the iCarbonX patients like me transaction that involved personal health information where a divestiture was required. And by the way, the government has the ability to require call for what's called mitigation, something less than having to sell the business. It can put all sorts of other controls in place like special security agreements, et cetera. But in these, they took the extreme measure. And then recently you had the ByteDance musical TikTok personal information. In, in the, the med tech space, you have an interesting case of the exobionics China JV, where the CFIUS can, you know, have jurisdiction over foreign JVs if, if a, a U.S. business is contributed. That involves exoskeletons, where they where they essentially block that transaction. So, and and there's one another one in the Crete uh, biotest where the U.S. Uh, company, a plasma company, had to spin off uh, a, a transaction to get approval. So we're seeing that it is impacting companies in the life sciences space, and we'll talk a little bit more about exactly where that is. Um, we've also seen recently Civia is being much more aggressive about coming in in the middle of transactions and, and, use, and blocking them. Um, we, we've now seen um, this with the Broadcom, uh, hostile takeover of Qualcomm, and very recently, this is like within days, uh, the, it used its authority to block the wise uh, acquisition of Magnachip, where there was very little business in the United States. There was a U.S. publicly traded shell. It was largely a Korean business, and a lot of people were scratching their heads trying to figure out what the national security implications are. Um, so let's talk about the mandatory rules and why that was a game changer for companies. So in, it, it, it came out in October. The regulations went into effect very fast. And so companies, the reason this became challenging is that the mandatory rules kick in where a company has critical technology. Well, what does that mean? And you have a foreign investor that's coming in with certain rights. So, you know, a lot of early stage companies, they've not bothered to classify their technology for export control purposes. And, and you'll see, I'm gonna drill down deeper into what critical technology is. So they, they suddenly these, these early stage companies that, that don't think of themselves as exporters had to figure out whether they had critical technology. And then they had to scramble to try to figure out if the foreign party had control rights that brought them within the review of, of the regulations. Well, so what was our experience in the last uh, couple of years? About 120, it wasn't thousands of transactions that were caught by this. There were 100, 120. And, and they kept this mandatory regime. They did make some changes to it. And now it's very much driven by whether you need to get an export authorization. And they've gotten away from these 27 NAICS categories that they used to before. But a lot of the reasons that there weren't as many filings was, it turns out a lot of early stage companies, particularly in life sciences, didn't have critical technology. And the other reason is that um, there were ways, there are workarounds transactionally to, to, uh, to limit the rights of foreign persons. So even if they did have critical technology, they wouldn't have access to material non-public technical information. They wouldn't have a board seat, an observer right, um, and, and other things that would trigger jurisdiction. So people got smarter in terms of dealing with this. And so the impact wasn't as draconian on the venture capital community. And we'll talk a little bit about the fears about um, the critical technology definition, you know, going, uh, get, get expanded and capturing more deals. So, you know, talking about China, look, there's a significant drop off. I've been working 37 years with cross-border U.S.-China, uh, both inbound and outbound investment. And 2016 was kind of the peak year. But a lot of those transactions have been stopped, not so much by CFIUS as much by the Chinese government not allowing cap capital to go out. It's been an, it's mixture. The one area that is remarkably resilient is life sciences, you know, venture capital money. When you look at the statistics, and I've I've quoted the uh, Rhodium, which is a good source on, you know, bilateral, you know, two-way U.S.-China investment. 
Um, it's actually fairly strong. There have been a number of rounds I've worked on in the last year, uh, probably a dozen rounds involving Chinese investors in early stage biotech. So it's very much up um, or, or stable. And it's also very much being watched by the US government. And I'll, and I'll talk about that. So the key you know, for, for our life sciences companies to figure out whether you're gonna be caught by a mandatory filing turns on the definition of critical technology and sensitive personal data. There are other things that can capture a, a company critical infrastructure, but those are things like pipelines and energy systems that life sciences companies as a rule don't have. There's also a set of real estate rules that where you're close to a, um, a military installation that generally is not a factor for most life sciences companies. So the two things we focus on when we analyze whether you're going to get caught by CFIUS are, does the company have critical technology or sensitive personal data? So what, what the heck does that mean? So let's look at the definition of critical technology. You've got technology covered by the International Traffic and Arms Regulation. So, you know, that covers military stuff or stuff that's, you know, designed for the military. In the life sciences space, it's largely biodefense and bio warfare and measures related to that. So if you're not in that space, the chances are you're not going to be caught by ITAR. And that's something that, you know, we do, when we, we'll talk about diligence in life sciences transaction. That's one area. B, the, the commerce control list, that's a lot of where we're going to be focusing today. Um, and we'll talk about the, the provisions that are covered under that. Control nuclear rated technology. Um, I've had this come up, for example, in nuclear medicine, but it's usually not a relevant issue for life sciences companies unless you're in the nuclear medicine space. Select agents or toxins, these are things that are pathogens and toxins that a number of life sciences companies actually use and sometimes use in the clinical development process. So it's something you have to check. But you know what, what, where this gets complicated is you may be using genetic material from one of these that's not virulent, but it may still be controlled by the regulation. So you really need to talk to somebody who's expert in how these things are classified. And then the new bucket that was created by the statute that created a lot of concern was emerging or foundational technologies that were gonna be added by the Department of Commerce. And we'll talk about what's happened here or not happened here more precisely. So we'll talk about that in, in a moment. So I mentioned that you know this was a, a total change for early stage companies that don't think of themselves, they're focused on scientific development. They're not thinking about exporting because they're largely sitting in the lab. Um, and suddenly this become a very fact intensive exercise of figuring out, do I have critical technology? I've spent countless hours on the phone with, uh, with early stage companies trying to figure out the answer to that question. And, you know, I've gotten kind of comfortable in doing it. We have checklists to help companies do that. Um, but this can sometimes result in surprises because most science based companies, they only think about you know, the scientific development and maybe uh, regulatory approval from the FDA standpoint. But they don't think about export control implications. And, you know, CFIUS, when you're, if you're going to accept foreign capital, it's something you have to be thoughtful about when you're choosing your technology, but very few companies do that. And so, as I mentioned, um, this is more complicated, by the way, for biopharmaceutical companies, particularly ones in the biologics, than it is for med tech companies. Med tech companies, you know, you're looking at a limited set of entries for equipment and often looking at encryption software. But for biologics, there, there are many more things you have to check. And then, of course, you've got the sensitive personal data question, and we'll come back, back at that in a phone. And we've developed in the CFIUS you know, legal community um, a lot of checklists to help companies go through these classifications. And if you're interested, I can you know, share those with you separately. But it is an exercise. Um, so here's just some relevant websites. And I'm going to show you just for example, I mentioned the commerce control list is, is one that usually for our life sciences companies, we have to go through. And I'm not going to spend any time this. I've just shown you, there's a fair amount of material on that website link that I shared with you that shows you where you have to look and the types of things that are controlled. It picks up chemicals, test kits, biological agents, vaccines, biopharmaceutical, then production equipment, and then technology related to that. 
but it is a process to go through. And it's not something you can do with, you know, in, 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 for some companies, it's a matter of hours. For some companies, it can take a few days. And sometimes you have to go into the U.S. government and they have a very friendly group there that helps people classify technology formally. And I've taken clients in there in order to get things classified because you don't want to guess and get it wrong. Um, now, let's talk about emerging and foundational technologies. The government hasn't moved it on this at all. In fact, they've been criticized. There's a fairly conservative group called the US-China Economic and Security Reform Commission that has published a study that I put the link to here very recently, June 1, that talks about um, the slowness by which they've added new technologies. When the government came out with an advance notice of public rulemaking in November of 2018, they listed a couple of areas and which got everybody very excited. Nanobiology, synthetic biology, genomic and genetic engineering and neurotech, but they haven't regulated. There was one proposed rule that had to do with software that was used for here, nucle nucleic acid assemblers and synthesizers that hasn't been finalized. And so the government is criticized. Now, the industry is lobbying very heavily against this. Um, and, and, and we're seeing, what we're seeing is there's some interagency conflicts, but we're also seeing significant lobbying from bio, from pharma and other med tech companies who are very concerned that an expansion of controls will interfere with mutually beneficial scientific development and collaboration. So this is a huge battle and this battle is gonna continue. And it's one where I tell all of my clients in the industry, you have to be active, you have to be watching this carefully, and you have to either directly or through trade associations weigh into the lobbying. Because if they, if they start to regulate uh, it, it more expansively in these areas, um, it could have a chilling effect on collaboration and, and cross-border activity. So something to watch in this space. So sensitive personal data, that's the other trap. Now, let me just make a comment. What's really interesting here, when you get to the distinction between mandatory and the voluntary rules, unless you're, 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 the investor is a, a, a government-owned entity, meaning 49% owned by the government, and, and you're talking about a substantial 25% interest, the thing that triggers mandatory filings is only critical technology. It's not sensitive personal data, but as you saw from the prior slides that I mentioned, you can get into trouble because you may not be a, a, a mandatory filing uh, case, but the government could come in and say, wait a minute, you know, we're worried you have sensitive personal data. And a lot of those cases that I mentioned, the so-called non-notified cases involve data. And so when you're looking at this, you know, when I represent I'm often on the company side, and, but I'm often on the investor side. When, when I represent the investor, I always look at the sensitive personal data issue, particularly for life sciences companies doing clinical trial work, you know, not super early stage where it's, where it's pre-IND and they're doing bench work, because this can come back to haunt you. You may not have a filing requirement, but if you don't address the issue, you're going to be addressing it with CFIUS when they come knocking after the, after the press release on, on the deal. And I actually have a couple of those non-notified outreaches from CFIUS going on right now in the life sciences space. So, and they are watching press releases about investment, particularly from Chinese funds and Chinese biotech companies. So it's something you have to be careful about. So what is sensitive personal data? There are a bunch of different categories. It, it's, it's gotta be something that's identifiable. So it's not aggregated or anonymized. You have to be able to identify the individuals. Um, it doesn't include, you know, encrypted data, but if the if the company can, you know, de-encrypt it, then it then it can cover that, and it covers a broad range of things. And we've seen, you know, transactions in the insurance industry blocked over access to sensitive personal data, um, biometric data, geolocation data, personal security clearance data, um, the, and we'll get to genetic data in a second. For, for, for identifiable data, such well, it, 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 there's, there's, it's looking largely at big data or data that is focused on pro tailoring products or services to US security personnel, including contractors like military and other people. They're particularly, that was the problem in um, 
in TikTok, it was the problem in Grindr. The military can use connection created a problem. And in, so, in these cases of this data, they're looking at um, you know, a million or more individuals in, in a 12 month period. But there are certain kinds of data that's not subject to that rule. So for example, genetic data is not subject to those two eliminations. Um, and so you know, the issue then becomes, um, do you have identifiable genetic information? And in some clinical trials, you may not have it because of the clinical trial protocols, but in others, you may have access to it. And again, it doesn't necessarily, you know, if you're talking about a clinical trial with 12 people, you know, it's not likely that the government is going to be concerned unless they happen to be senior members of the US military, then you have a different issue, but that would be a very unusual clinical trial. But at, you know, so, so be aware that the genetic data piece of this is a little bit trickier than the, lar than the ones that require those two, those two elements. And they made a little bit of, of a change from the proposed rules to, to final, um, that where they limited the definition of the results of an individual's genetic test. It was, it was even broader before that would have captured almost every clinical trial. So they made a tweak here. But this is a little bit you know, tricky in this. Again, what's tricky about this is it doesn't trigger the mandatory rules, but it can be a reason for CFIUS to come in and review it. So when I'm advising clients, even though it may not be subject to the mandatory rule, there may be instances where I would recommend if there's, for example, the presence of sensitive personal data, that the foreign investor condition the, um, the, the transaction on CFIUS clearance. And we'll talk about what that means. It's not the end of the world, uh, given, given the experience. Uh, a lot of transactions involving China have been cleared. Um, we, only, we, we don't hear about those as much. We hear about the ones that are not cleared. And so the, you know, the press reporting on this is somewhat skewed. And I know the press reporting, I think, in China is even more skewed in terms of negativity about CFIUS. So uh, this is a bit of a reality. I'm not saying it's not an issue, but I'm not saying it is not a giant wall that cannot be worked around or, 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 or passed over in some, tra in some transactions. Um, OK, so let's talk about, let's shift now from the technical to strategic transactional issues. So, you know, I always look at the transactions and, and figure out, okay, does CFIUS have jurisdiction? Meaning can CFIUS, do I have to file or can CFIUS even file, you know, uh, come in to knock, knock on the door because they can assert jurisdiction. So, you know, buyer investor, is it a foreign person? Well, sometimes that's clear. You know, it's a direct investment by say a Chinese investment fund. Um, a, a U.S. subsidiary of a, of a Chinese company will be a foreign person for CFIUS purposes. But there's a lot of Chinese investment coming in through funds, and there's an exemption uh, for private investment funds that are managed by U.S. persons. And I think what, what's happening in a lot of cases is for non-strategic financial investors who want to participate in this market, many are coming in through funds that are not actually foreign persons for CFIUS purpose, and you don't have to deal with that issue. Now, we've had a lot of talk about how you set up these funds. I know, Ella, you and I have talked about this and, and, and what the limits are. You know, you, you, in, unless you're a well-established fund, you can, you can assume that CFIUS will come, and if you take the position that you're not subject to it, they may come in and check you on that. So, you know, it's something, particularly if, you know, you have a limited number of Chinese investors and you know, it's an offshore fund, but there is a US person, they may look at that closely depending upon the asset that's being invested in or, or acquired. Um, so the other thing that we look at, the, the other thing we look at is uh, you know, companies track record with CFIUS. Some companies have no track record. You know, they've never cleared anything with CFIUS. There are, CFIUS doesn't publish a, a list of companies of concern, but we know from experience that there are some. Now, they're not any that I you know, can really identify in the biotech uh, space. But, you know, for example, the poster child of this would be Huawei that, you know, it basically can't, you know, it's not going to get a clearance from CFIUS on a transaction. But that's in the telecom space. Uh, there's some companies that, that CFIUS will look at in, in, the, in, the, in the life sciences space, but nothing, nothing where they're of that category of, of concern. But you know, that's something you wanna, you wanna know. Does a company have experience with, with CFIUS? A number have clear transactions and are viewed 
not negatively by CFIUS. So that's something that you want to look at. Then the other thing we look at is, can you structure the transaction so that there is no CFIUS jurisdiction? This is legitimate. This is not evasion. For example, license and collaboration agreement where there's no equity involved is not considered a covered investment. And you know there may be export control issues. You have to deal with those for the reasons I mentioned before, but it may not be a covered transaction unless somehow the license or collaboration agreement gives access to critical technology, material non-public to information or substantive decision-making. So in the life sciences space, this is a major loophole that a lot of companies have used. You know, there is often when you do a license and collaboration agreement, an equity piece, but sometimes people are saying, well, we're gonna eliminate the equity piece. Or if you have the equity piece, you then screen out the foreign investors so they don't have any of this information. And if you look at the standard NVCA um, documentation, their standard language, I've done this in a number of cases, but be forewarned that if, if it's a Chinese investor that the US government is watching and it's a technology that they're watching, you may have to, because I'm going through it right now, explain to CFIUS why this is not a covered transaction because you've screened them out of all these things. I have one of these going on right now that was triggered by the government looking at a press release. Um, you know, so then you look at, as I said, national security implications. Depends on whether you're on the company side or, or, the, or the foreign investor side. The foreign investor is most at risk here because the government doesn't unwind the transaction. The government can force the foreign investor to divest. Now that can have implications for the US company, but a lot of the risk is on the foreign investor if they get this wrong. The other thing that, that I do in advance when I'm counseling clients is look at mitigation strategies. There are things you can do like spinning off problematic product lines or assets or putting special security agreements into place that anticipate concerns that the US government might have and you put it yourself in a position where you're better, better able to clear a transaction or argue that it's not covered by their jurisdiction. Um, obviously, you know, you there are some high profile deals that we have where our clients bring in lobbyists and, and PR people to get involved. Those are those are rare, and you've got to be very careful if you're going to do that, that you comply with all the Foreign Agent Registration and Lobbying Disclosure Act rules. The U.S. government is cracking down very heavily on those. So be aware. So now man, let's talk about mandatory filing. And I'm going to move fairly quickly because I want to leave time, and I've covered a lot of this, for Q&A. So we've got the mandatory filing for, and, and basically um, where, where, where the requirement is, unless you're state owned, unless the investor is a government, it's all triggered by critical technology. But if you have critical technology, go to this bullet here, this fourth bullet, you can eliminate the border observer seat and you can have screening language that's already now fairly standardized in the NVCA documents to avoid having any of these rights, the so-called Defense Production Act rights, unless and until the transaction is cleared with CFIUS. Um, and we'll, we'll talk in a minute about clearance. Um, so that's what mandatory requirements. For governments, I mentioned the rule, you know, the rules are very different. If, if the government's got a 49% interest and it's a 25% um, inv investment, then they look at critical technology and sensitive personal data and critical infrastructure. And those, all three of those will trigger a, a mandatory filing. So, you know, if the government's involved, sensitive personal data becomes a trigger for mandatory filings. I do some work with sovereign wealth funds and state-owned enterprises, so I'm, I'm familiar with this. Even if you're representing, as I mentioned, a non-government-owned entity, you want to be sensitive to these issues because they may you know, cause you to, to, to come out one way or another on the subject of, do I make a voluntary filing and do I condition this investment on clearance with CFIUS? There, there are some exceptions. Don't apply to China. They apply to certain so-called friendly countries, Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom are the only ones that have this treatment. So, you know, even Germany, um, uh, Ireland, and places like that don't have this. Um, and, and we won't spend a lot of time on those. Um, so um, 
I did mention the investment fund exception. I'm not going to spend, since I think most of the people here on the company side, if you want to take advantage of this investment fund section, uh, exception, there are special rules. Uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, setting up funds that, that qualify for this or making sure if we have a sovereign wealth fund client that they're insulated because they're really not interested in anything other than the financial return. So we can limit their, their ability to, to look through to the underlying investment. This is very, very commonly done. But, but bear in mind that if it's a new fund and it's a sensitive technology, the US government may come in and ask to see all your, of your documentation to see whether you actually qualify or not. Okay, to file or not to file, that is the question. I'm gonna put this in. So, so here's, the, here's the issue. A lot of people think, okay, I'm not subject to the mandatory rules, I'm done. Well, not so fast for the reasons I mentioned. Because of the non-notified transaction risk, you gotta actually think strategically. There is a process and it's actually being used more and more to get a 30 day review. A lot of the concern with in the venture capital community because venture capital deals move very quickly. You know, they can start and finish in 30 days. I've done a lot of them in, in a very tight timeline. Um, and the normal CFIUS review process can be months. But there is a fast track process that people are using more and more. And you can see the, um, you can see the statistics here that came out in the, the latest annual report of doing something in 30 days, you can't close over it. Um, and you can see that the number really went up in the um, number of declarations that, that have been used um, between 2019, 2020. One of the concerns with the declarations is that at the end of the 30 day review period, the government can, one, they can require you to make a full filing, then you know you're in for a longer period, but that's been technically rare. Um, when you look at the statistics. The other is they give you kind of a shrug. They don't tell you one way or another if you're cleared. But more and more people are getting comfortable closing over a shrug. And they're, you know, they're no longer allowed to wait. So in some deals, even though you're not subject to the mandatory rules, some foreign investors are saying, you know what, I wanna, I wanna condition this on, on a declaration filing. But they may say, I'm willing to close, you know, I'm I'm willing um uh to to um you know, close over what's called a shrug, which is, you know, non-approval. And I'm seeing many, many deals like that, but that comes down to negotiating leverage, you know, in terms of between the company and the investor as to whether you're gonna do that or not. Um, in some cases, you know, competitively bid situations, the US companies are saying, no, you take the risk. And the foreign companies, if they like the company, the foreign investors are saying, I'll take the risk of CFIUS coming knocking, but I'll, I'll, I'll position the transaction so I'm in a good position if CFIUS does come knocking in terms of reviewing it. You know, so we've, we've talked about the, you know, you, you do your due diligence and then you kind of do a risk assessment. You know, is the, is the investor somebody that has a good or bad track record? You know, how sensitive is this information? Are there government contracts? Are, are they dealing with the military or not? In many cases, you know, the decisions made for a, a garden variety, ordinary life sciences deal that doesn't involve a government investor, that if there's no mandatory filing, they're gonna take their chance. And, you know, and, and, and if CFIUS comes calling, you know, they'll deal with it. But, but it, if you look statistically, it, it's very rare for them to block a deal. It's also rare for them to impose mitigation. I just mentioned filing fees. For declarations, by the way, there are no filing fees. This is only something new that came into, a, into effect recently. There are penalties if you, if you get it wrong. Um, and CFIUS is beginning to assert penalties. And if you miss a mandatory filing, you know, it's technically could be a significant um, penalty in theory up to the value of the transaction. We have not yet seen such a penalty assessed. Most of these penalties are for breaching so-called mitigation agreements with the government. But you know, there may be a there may be a, a, a time when we see that. Um, so non-notified transaction reviews, no question this is going up, and no question that this involves more often than not Chinese investors. I don't think you can deny that statistically speaking. It's happened before, but in most recent data we have. 
in the, in the, for the fiscal year 2020, this was in the report that was just released. Um, there are outreaches in 117 transactions. But of the 117, you know, parties provided notification. It can be a time consuming process, by the way, and you can provide a lot of notification. CIVI has only requested that they make a full filing in 17 of those cases. So, you know, that's a, that's a small percentage overall. And then it's an even smaller percentage of transactions where there's mitigation required or, um, or there's divestiture. Again, those are the cases that grab the headlines, but in a way it distorts the perception of what's going on in CFIUS. And CFIUS staff is very professional. Um, I, I would say there's not an anti-China bias there. They're very professional about doing it. Statistically speaking though, they're more concerned about you know, Chinese transactions. And when you look at the blocking and the reviewing more often, but not exclusively, we've had plenty of reviews of Russian and certain Middle Eastern you know, countries where we've had that. And remember that divestiture is only the worst case scenario. There's other mitigation techniques that we've used. I've list, listed them here regarding special security agreements or committees. We have, a, we have a whole toolkit of mitigation techniques that we've developed over the years to address these kinds of issues. So let's talk a little bit about identify. The important thing about this is don't leave these issues to the end. You know, you, I advise companies that are raising money, particularly from foreign investors, to do self diligence on CFIUS issues. So they're prepared because they're going to get a questionnaire. I can tell you that, you know, I have, I have, um, and, and I'm willing to share it with people if they're interested. I have a life sciences CFIUS questionnaire that it covers both um, the assets and the technology and sensitive personal data, as well as encryption, because Encryption can, you know, depending upon the level of encryption, can often ca capture things. And what I advise companies to do is, is really look at look at where they're situated for CFIUS purposes. Because if they're clean, and by the way, investors are going to ask you to make a rep and warranty in the documents that you don't have critical technology, sensitive personal data, or critical infrastructure. And you're going to have to do your homework to be able to make that rep and warranty. But I advise companies when I'm representing them, particularly uh, when there are foreign investors involved, to deal with this early on, because it can be time consuming. And I mentioned there's standardized language developing now, the NVCA language. There's a lot of market language out there on, in terms of how to deal with this, how to structure venture capital investments to screen out foreign persons. You know, a lot, we've done we've done a lot in the last two years uh, to make this a lot more user friendly. And the important thing, obviously, is to get somebody doing your deal who knows these issues. Um, I have the benefit of being both a deal lawyer and a regulatory lawyer. So it's rare to find those skill sets in one person. You usually have to do it in in two. But I've I've been working so much in the life sciences space on deal work that I that I became expert, and I also practice in D.C. for many many years. And not just in Boston that um, do this. And and I must review, uh, you know, my own deals, but dozens of deals um, in the space of a month. Where sometimes it's an, you know, it, it's a simple analysis, and sometimes it gets a lot more complicated. But it can slow down your deal. Um, and so, you know, a lot of expertise is being developed. But it's in, you know, it's a small group of people who really know the life sciences space very well. I'm going to stop there because I wanted to leave enough time for questions. That's my bio. You can look at that. But anyway, so do we have questions in the queue from anybody? We have one person, Jason asked the definition of US person. Um, uh -huh. whether, yeah, that's a citizen or green card holder. Yeah, so so it's a, okay, so, so the it's an interesting it's an interesting definition of U.S. person. Um, it, it has to be, as, as a general rule, it has to be a citizen and somebody who doesn't own allegiance to another country. We sometimes have an issue with dual citizens. Now, my understanding, but Ella, correct me if I'm wrong, China doesn't allow dual citizens with the U.S. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and and China's and that's a China position, not a U.S. position, because U.S. does allow dual citizens. So yeah, this this has come up, for example, I, I I know a number of Chinese nationals who are permanent resident aliens in the United States, and they say, "Can I be the manager of the fund?" And I say, "It's not going to work, because the U.S. government will not view you that way." And and with China, you don't have the dual citizenship issue which becomes interesting, by the way, for some other nationalities, but, but where you have dual nationality, but um, we don't have that issue with China. For, for, a, for an individual, it's, it's really based on citizenship and, and no allegiance to another person. The definition is kind of interesting. Um, and so you sometimes get you know, really interesting you know, questions for people that, you know, US is a nation of immigrants. Um, that, you know, people that, and, and particularly, um, there's some transactions where the U.S. government is looking at Chinese nationals who have become U.S. citizens, given up their nationality, trying to figure out, are they U.S. persons for CFIUS purposes? And that's an interesting question, and, and, and it's something that people are looking at. They, they should be, but, you know, I think that if, if you look at the definition, now for, for an entity, you know, it, it's a it, in a way it's more complicated because you have to look at who controls it. So obviously, a foreign a U.S. subsidiary of a, of a Chinese company is a, is a is a foreign person. But remember that control for CFIUS is defined very very broadly. It is not the way corporate lawyers define control, which is usually a majority of the equity or the ability to vote for a majority of the board. That's how a corporate lawyer defines control. Civius defines control in a way that looks more like the ability to influence. So a, a company on, on material decisions. So Civius has found control by a foreign person where a foreign investor had as low as 15% and had a board seat. Now, most lawyers would say, you're crazy. That's not control, but in, in, in some transactions, and there's some precedent here, CFIUS, because they wanted to exercise jurisdiction, has found that to be control. And the regulations, if anyone's interested, have some interesting examples of what is and what is not control. But I've gotten into debates with CFIUS over this issue because I felt I had constructed a transaction where there was no control, that the, the minority rights were uh, were ones that they listed as not conveying control. And Sylvia said, well, the regulations are only examples. We ultimately decide whether there's control or not. So be aware that the control test is ultimately in the eyes of CFIUS. And so you have to be careful. So, so in venture deals, you know, if you're under 10% and you're not on the board, don't have board rights, whatever, there's a passive investor exception that a lot of people rely on. But once you go above that, you may be in a control scenario. And if you're, control, if you're a US entity controlled by a foreign person, then when you do a deal with another US entity, you may be considered a foreign person under the CFIUS regulations. So, so Carl, I want to uh, also verify for that question, since I also heard from some lawyer, they were saying for this uh, 10% the passive investment rule that uh, we all heard of, we, we all know like from uh, two years ago, seems it's not apply anymore. Uh, right now, yeah. That, that's, that's, not, that's not true, it's changed. First of all, there was never an absolute thing. What you have to do is there is a rule, and I can show you in the regulations where it is. It has to meet the test of purely passive investment. And what people don't realize is if you sit on the board or you have certain other rights, board, board observer rights, whatever, you will not fall in the definition of purely passive investment. But for example, Chinese you know, companies of all kinds buy you know, less than 10% positions in the open market of US companies all the time. And without a board seat or without any contractual rights, the US government has no jurisdiction over that. And they've, they've held that before. But if they get a board seat, you're no longer, or other contractual rights, you may no longer be on the, the passive investor rule. So it's a very, the exception's still there. It's slightly differently, differently worded. It's still there, but it is very narrowly construed. Very narrowly construed. And I can show you in the, it's in the regulatory sections 
that deal with what is and what is not that. And people, a lot of people like to think that something's passive, but they don't really check the definition of what is passive. And, 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 and it turns out that it's not, what they're doing is not, not viewed as passive by the government. So that's, that's, the, that's the issue. There's no, there's no carte blanche under 10% exception. That's, that's a, and there never was, by the way. Uh, there, there never was. But it, it got simplified by that. It was always looking, because you can have control with less than 10%. And you can also be above 10% and not have control as a practical matter. No. So you got to look at all the facts and circumstances. OK. Um, and we have next question. Um, what is a general turnaround time for CFIUS reviews? It depends on, so if you're going under a declaration, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had increased, they have better resources. Um, you know, I like to tell clients it can easily be a couple months, but you know, in a declaration, but, and, and I say that because it can take one to two weeks to prepare the declaration for, and then you've got to get, you know, submit it to CFIUS and, and make sure it's complete before the clock starts running on the third, 30 days. We've, we've had transactions cleared under declaration in, in 45, 60 days. Um, you know, so it's not as if, it, it, in a simple case, you know, it, it can get more complicated. I, and I, I don't want anyone to think that that is the norm, but there has been an improvement in, easy, in easier cases using declarations. I think the data suggests that that's going to be used more, more often. Um, in more complicated cases, you know, where there's some serious issues, or either because of the participants or the technology, you know, we're warning clients that it's a matter of months. And, and then, you know, there may be risks, deal completion risks. But that's where you need, you know, sophisticated advisors. Now, I have to say, even though we, we've developed a lot of sophistication about what the government compare, cares about, they do, in, they do intelligence work on, and gather information that we don't have access to, and you may never have access to. And they can sometimes identify a national security issue that you're completely blindsided by because the company didn't even know it was an issue. They may be dealing with a party that they didn't know was government owned or controlled or, um, you know, it, it, it happens rarely, but it does happen. Um, it, it, it's not, it's not unheard of. Okay. Uh, we have uh, uh, two more questions. Uh, one is what is outlook for changes in CFIUS in the future, if there are any? <laughs> What's the outlook for what, China and CFIUS? Yeah. Um, look, look, the oh, reality so is. Yeah. Go huh? ahead. Go, go I, mean, ahead. I don't. I don't. I don't have a crystal ball. What I can tell you is, Biden has not shown any direction away from the trend that we saw starting with Trump, and we began to see it, by the way, under Obama, which is very strict reviews. Um, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of publicity around block deals, but there are a lot of deals that are being cleared. So I, I don't think it's all negative. I think every deal is different, um, but I don't see the situation changing in a more positive direction. You know, the US government relaxing anytime soon, it could move in the different direction. I mean, right now, uh, I'm talking later this evening about, about US-China trade policy to, to some Japanese life sciences companies. Right now, the, the USTR, you know, Catherine Tai is, is starting a review of US-China policy. You know, so far, what we don't know where it's going. There was one particularly negative meeting between Secretary of State Blinken and 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 the Chinese delegation in, in Anchorage didn't start very well. And the reality is, a lot of what Biden is doing is a continuation of before. They really haven't developed their own policy. That's a long discussion that we can have separately. But I would not count on any alleviation of the strict scrutiny rules that are applying you know, for certain Chinese companies in certain industries, but it is very case by case. It, it would be a mistake to think that just because it involves Chinese in, in, in investments and in and, and a US high tech company that you can't get it clear. That's, that's just wrong. We, we've, had a, we've had a fair amount of success. It's only certain companies, certain industries where you run into issues. 
I, I agree. There's always um, a, a misunderstanding, like a, a, for all this, uh, for instance, a gene th a therapy, cell therapy, or those uh, medtech case that involve patients' data would be counted as, as a critical technology goes into at least a voluntary failing, but that is not really the case. Today you mentioned, for instance, about the number of the patients, about whether the data can be identified or not yeah. identified. So it's really case by case. It's very, it's very, very case by case. And you know, CFIUS publicly is very clear, we're not anti-China. Now, a lot of people are cynical and say, look at the statistics. Well, you know, there are many more transactions being reviewed involving China, and the ones blocked predominantly are Chinese. Um, and so you can't ignore that fact, but that's not, shouldn't lead to the conclusion that we're not open for Chinese investing because that, that's not true. Got it. Um, and we got one last question from Karen. Uh, practically speaking, if startup, uh, for instance, AI or um, computer vision tech has raised new rounds, including from international VCs, angels, what is the process? just gave an example, should uh, the founders, US investors be worried? And if yes, what should they do immediately? So this is a really good uh, um, uh, case. Uh, could it uh, help us so, out? Yeah, so, so, you know, I mentioned that it's important that companies do self cifius diligence and understand. And sometimes, by the way, I've been retained um, in later rounds and the, there wasn't CFIUS counsel in the early rounds. And, and we do a look to see whether we, there was a problem. In some cases, the earlier rounds were before, you know, lucky, luckily before November of 2018, before the mandatory filings came in. But again, in a lot of ones that I've looked at, because of the definition, the narrow definition of critical technology, the companies could breathe a sigh of relief that they didn't violate the rules. But, but bear in mind that Technology changes over time and, and, and a round may be fine, but that doesn't mean the next round is fine or the exercise of round. You continually have to look at um, the risk profile of, of a company because it may acquire or develop critical technology. It may acquire or develop sensitive personal data. So it's an ongoing process of review and it needs to be baked into the venture capital fundraising the concept given given the strict scrutiny, if you're going to bring in foreign investors in 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 in, in this space, and and particularly if you're going to bring in you know Chinese investors, you have to be real careful, and you want to be very thoughtful about how you do the deal. You're not violating the mandatory rules, but also building together a structure that you will feel comfortable presenting to CFIUS if it comes knocking after it sees your press release. And, and that is a trigger, by the way. One, one that I'm doing right now is triggered by a press release. And sometimes the other thing to be careful about is some of these press releases are very grandiose because the marketing people want to make it sound more than it is. Well, that guess what? That can attract more attention from the government. And then you spend a lot of time explaining, well, well, no, well, the press release wasn't real. That's not really what happened here. You know, it was a small investment, whatever. But you have to be careful because the companies and the investors sometimes work against their own interests in issuing press releases that are not scrutinized by lawyers who know how that will be perceived by the government. Something you got to be really careful about. And also for the startup, they need to do if they if they have if they're about to take money from new investors, especially Chinese investors, they better do some also analysis. If, if yeah, they, absolutely. If you reach out to your lawyer. You should always prepare yourself. Yeah, ex ex exactly. And, and um, you know, you have to be careful because the, the bigger firms have CFIUS expertise. There are a lot of firms that are just pure tech firms that do a lot of startup work that really don't have the CFIUS expertise. And I've seen this problem. So you need to really be careful about this. If you're going to raise money from foreign investors, you, get, you need to get somebody. And there's a, there are a number of us. I'm certainly not the only one. But, but there are a number of us that specialize. You really need a specialist in this. Uh, not somebody who's an amateur. And, and, and I've seen a lot of the firms that are very narrowly tech focused. They just don't have, they don't have the CFIUS and they don't have the export control expertise because CFIUS now is tied to export control. And that's a very specialized expertise. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we, we can only take one last question. I, I know many audience do want to ask more, but we, we don't have much, we, we are already over 11. So let's go with last question. 
How about the greenfield exception? If a foreign parent entity invests in its own U.S. subsidiary, if that is outside of CFS jurisdiction? Yeah, so that's a really good, really good question. Um, because what triggers CFS review is either the acquisition of control or the investment in a, in a US business. And so there's a so-called greenfield exception where something is not a US business. And, and, and there's a lot of guidance in the regulations, but let me give you a cautionary tale that involves Huawei. So Huawei bought the assets of a company called Freeleaf in bankruptcy a number of years ago. And again, Huawei is a special case, you know, because they're subject to, to, to scrutiny. Um, they thought they were buying only assets and not a US business. And the government said, no, you know, you're not just buying intellectual property rights, you're getting people, you're getting customers less. That looks like a business. So there is an exception, but the, there is often not a bright line. And, and I've used this exception for startup companies. You know, if you're setting up a Chinese company, setting up a US operation on its own, and it's hiring people and, and transporting technology, that's not a covered transaction. You know, that's easy. That's easy. If it starts, but if it does a joint venture with a US company, then you got to look at, okay, is the US company and the Chinese company will control it, again, defined broadly, then you have to look at, okay, is the US company contributing a US business to the joint venture? And I can tell you that's a can be a complex analysis. Um, but, but, you know, I've looked at this very carefully in a number of biotech JVs, and we've gotten comfortable that, well, in, in two cases, one that there was an argument that it was not a business, but then we also got comfortable that there was no critical technology, which made it even easier to not file with, with, with CFIUS. But, but people have to be really careful relying on the Greenfield exception, because it, it, it's easy in the case of a complete startup, you know, where, where there's nothing there, and you're leasing property, bringing people over, bringing technology over, because there is always that hook of, well, is a US business being contributed or being acquired? So it, it, there are a number of examples in the regulations that deal with when this is and what isn't. I encourage people to read those examples in the regulations because they, they, they show you where the, where the gray area is. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, it's a really uh, exciting topic and a very uh, 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 interesting tips also about this, um, how could we really interpret the CFIUS law? Uh, and uh, if uh, uh, our audience has more questions, please just uh, reach out to Carl directly and his contact information is already presented here. Um, thank you so much and hope our audience find this today's uh, uh, talk being really helpful. Thank you again, Carl, for your um, valuable time. Well, thank, thank you, Ella and Karina, for inviting me. This was a pleasure. I said one of my favorite topics, and it is a very interesting topic. So I'm, I'm glad I could speak to your, your membership and happy to help. Great. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice day. Okay. Bye-bye.